Welcome to the Maritime Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Wioli. In each episode, we bring you exclusive interviews with maritime professionals, industry experts, and students. Our guests come from different backgrounds, including shipping, yachting, offshore, and more. Our goal is to give you all the knowledge you need to succeed in the maritime industry. Hello everyone, welcome back to a new podcast episode and today we are going to talk about vessel operations and I am with Istro, welcome Istro, it's a pleasure to having you in this podcast episode. So if you have a lot of experience as a vessel operator, uh, so of course we're going to talk about it. So today it's kind of introduction for of vessel operations for people who want to start a career in this field or just for curious people. So uh, Istro, can you introduce yourself please? Uh, well, uh, hello everyone and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to do this. Well, my name is Christos Pasov. I'm working in ship operations now from 15 years. I have a background as an assistant officer on the ship, uh, but that was since 2006, 2005. And uh, during my years of experience, I have been working basically with all kinds of size vessels. The smaller which I have the pleasure to operate is 6,000 dead weight till the biggest that exists, 200,000 dead weight, and that's only in dry bulk uh, sector. Uh, currently, I'm working for one very nice company called Shipping and Trading, and right now operating uh, Cape Size ships. Um, in general, the, how to say, the vessel operator is a challenging job, which I like very much. It's changing a lot. The bigger how to say changes and challenges nowadays, mm. which are very good, are the environmental, uh, not issues, but challenges that our sector and shipping have to take part. It's a must. There is no yeah. time for delay. And the good thing is that it's, I see a lot of changes. The governments are doing a lot. The IMO is doing a lot. And how is that implemented on a vessel operator? The, how to say, they change the rules. Uh, it become a little bit complicated, but mm. when you know it's for a good goal, it's make you how to yeah. make you happy, and you take the challenge with excitement. Okay, very interesting. So, can you uh, talk a little bit about the role of vessel operator? What is it? What is your mission? Your daily task for people who don't know or who wants to know more about it? Well, yeah, it's a long topic, but I will call quite. I will try to be quite short. Uh, the job of the vessel operator is basically to uh, instruct the master on the ship what he have to do. Basically, you have a voyage, let's say loading from one port, passing to a couple of seas and oceans, and to reach the other port and discharge the cargo. The vessel operator need to be uh, well informed about um, the vessel itself, the technical capabilities. Uh, the contract of carriage, so you need to you need to know a little bit about trading, a little a little bit about economics. You need to know how to say uh, to know basically two things: to know what is going on on the ship and what is going on on the ground in your office with the agents you're working. In general, your daily task is to monitor and to advise on a daily basis the master what to do. Okay. Okay. So, um, what kind of yeah. so you want to add something, maybe? Well, yes. I mean, I'm, I will try to be as short as possible in the same time to explain it. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, it because it's a vast topic. Uh, basically, you see, the vessel operator more or less need to know a little bit, uh, not about everything, but uh, let's put it this way. Uh, it's good the vessel operator to have seagoing experience. It's not a must, but it's mm -hmm. a big advantage. Okay. I can give you a very short ex example, if you like. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, uh, we had a master that he, during the day, we noticed that he lost some time. And as any other business, time is money. And we just ask him on the email, of course, here, master, what is going on? You have any issues, etc., etc. He said, well, we needed to deviate a little bit because in China Sea we passed to a lot of um, fishing vessels. Now, 
This is how to say not true. You cannot lose, let's say, something like half a day oh, yeah. when you're trying to avoid some fishing vessels. How do I know that? Well, I have been there. I have passing fishing vessels, especially in China. Sea. It's very, I would say, interesting things to see. You know, like you're in the middle of the ocean and you see, from vast distance, of course, uh, like a village. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the sea because oh, wow. they stay in one place when they find the fish and they stay there. Now imagine yourself, you are in China Sea. none of those people speak English. Mm, you yeah. can call on the VHF, blah, blah, blah. No, they will not move. All you got to do is shift your vessel a little bit aside, you bypass them and you come back. You're not losing any time. Mm. So I most kindly advise the captain, captain, um how to say not to offend you, but uh, please, what exactly happened? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, it, he knew that. <laughs> yeah, he had some problems with the engine. But oh. when you hire a ship and you pay a hire per day, it's exactly like you're renting a car. I don't want to pay for 12 hours when somebody's have a main engine problems, right? You will yeah. not pay when someone give you a broken car, you say, uh-uh, I will not pay for that, right? Yeah. So it's a good to have some experience. It helps. You may gain experience with the work, but let's say if you have it at the beginning of your career, it gives you advantages. Okay. Basically, you have been there. You mm. know what is there. And right now, my job is to monitor, advise, and instruct without being there, yes. you know, and I rely on the captain, I rely on the information he's giving me, but sometimes <laughs> there could be reasons the captain not to tell you the, the whole truth, uh, especially when you are hiring a ship, right? Okay, um, okay. <laughs> so you don't, you don't have like close relation with the captain on you, you just like... Yes, it's, it's mm. important to have a uh, good relations with the master. Yeah. Like any other part of your life, the communication skill is number one. Mm. I mean, okay, let's put it this way. I have two options in this situation. I could send an angry message. Captain, you are a liar, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. What will happen? We will start arguing and reach to nowhere. That's not a good approach. Never. I said, I actually I called him over the phone. I don't want to send an email. I said, Captain, please. Now, let's talk privately. <laughs> what happened? Yes. I mean, I explained him the situation. Captain, I have been there. I know what it is. Let's, let's put the cards on the table. Yeah. And he understood that I know what I'm talking about. I said, well, we had a main engine breakdown. We need to stop the couple of hours. I said, fine. Don't worry about it. Of course, like I said, time is money. And my job is to stop the higher stop the rent for those hours but i mean i also politely say to the head owners which are the owners of the ship guys i mean this is what happened i'm sorry but we cannot pay to a vessel that we cannot use for yes. this amount of time i could have gone what what have you doing you're giving me uh, this uh how they say to say a bit more polite, let's say this is not good ship. <laughs> <laughs> I could go to be on the offensive way, right? And what will I achieve? Nothing. Mm. The other guy would tell me, no, do that. But they used to, they were nice guys, said, nice guys. I said, okay, it's a mechanical failure here and that. Let's continue. So okay. one of the, I will say, the strong, how to, um, strong things, strong um, skills that operator must have is the uh, communication skills. This, this comes yes. first. Yes, I imagine. Yeah. Because you talk with many different actors, stakeholders, and you need to, to be very good at it because your job <laughs> depends on it. Yes, sometimes it's very difficult. I, I don't want to go with nationalities, but some nationalities are very difficult. I mean, yeah. uh, they will simply not accept if this was the situation, no matter how kind message I send, they will just disagree. It could be thousands of reasons. Let's say that this company have a financial issues. They will never accept mm. a single dollar to be cut. And you have to think about that. I mean, 
it's a negotiation all, all the time. Mm. All the time. And okay. you have to think twice. Okay. No, that, that's, uh, that's good to know this point. Um, what tasks, like technically, what tasks you have? Like, for example, you have a uh, ship planning. What, can you explain a little bit each of them to know what is exactly your job? Yes. Let's say I will, to be precise, I will speak about my job right now. So my company, right now, which I'm working, they do not own a ship. They hire a ship. Okay. And uh, this is a contract, time charter contract. Basically, my job is to communicate with the master to make sure the hire is paid on time, the rent, let's put it this way. And I need to know what our contract is. I need to know all about it. Let's say what rights I do have, mm. like the example I gave before. Yes, I do have right to claim because I have not used the ship, but... Sometimes, let's say, um, this is a topic like any contract, there is a force major clause. Let's say a typhoon passed by or something that is beyond uh, the, how to say, capabilities of the master of the owner to, to do. Let's say that I needed the vessel to arrive, mm, let's say, middle of September and he's delayed a one week and he passed by storm i cannot mm. claim that anything i cannot say anything to the captain he's passing through the storm yeah so it's important to know your contract with your counterparty because okay. we the ship owner is renting me a ship i pay him a hire it's very close to renting a car i mm. pay a hire per day and the fuel that's it mm. but if something happens which is uh responsibility of the owner i have a right to claim okay. now there is another contract which i mean i'm talking about specifically of my job right now this is a charter party contract of carriage now let's say i have already rented a ship now our trading team their job is to find a cargo for us to carry and to get paid for this, mm. for this service with our hired ship. So I'll give you an example. Right now, one of my ships, which I'm operating, is heading to Tubarão, that's in Brazil, is going to load approximately 180,000 tons of iron ore for Qingdao in China. So I have another contract, and that's a voyage charter. The difference here that we are getting paid on the amount of cargo we load. So as mm. much as we load, that much money we're going to receive. There's a lot of, how to say, paragraphs there. I cannot go with them uh, one by one. But the most important is that I need to know where are we going. I need to know what time we have to arrive. Why? Because let's say that you are a commodity trader and you trade iron ore and you have sell it to some factory in Kingdown. Yeah. They uh they want their cargo in some frame, time frame, right? So I need to know where I when I have to be at the low port. I'm calculating how much time we can get. We can mm. sorry, uh, watch time how much time it will take from low we port do. to, the, char to yeah. the charging port. How much I need to calculate how much fuel do we need? Mm. I need to calculate where we have to fuel, we have to take fuel let's say for example we are bypassing singapore singapore is a good place yes. we can bypass uh, cape of good hope uh, that's in south africa this is a good place to bunker take supply of fuel but <laughs> how to say there are a lot of storms there it's not the best place you want to be yes when you're taking fuel because when the storm is there you need to wait, you need to pay higher, maybe the price is better, maybe, but I need to calculate the risk. In Singapore, the weather is much better. It's, how to say, a uh, lot more convenient. Mm. And this is type, I'm giving an example, type of risk that you need to calculate. That's an operator's decision that, okay, I need to imagine in my head 
what the voyage is from low to discharging port, what exactly how to say, not perils, but risk there are. I'm talking about risk is the master responsibility of the ship. Uh, if any risks are for the cargo and for the crew. I can advise him, I can instruct him, but when talking about safety, the master mm. is the only responsible. Like I said in the beginning, he's there. I'm here in Varna, Bulgaria, we're chatting, sending emails back and forth, but he's there. And trust me, I was there. I have seen storms, storms yeah. with nine to six meters waves. Okay, I mean, if you know what you're doing, it's not dangerous, but it's how to say, uh, when I was there and I see the storms, I could never say a captain, captain, you just proceed, I don't care, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. So in general, what the operators do, he needs to uh, imagine in his head what the voyage will be, from loading to discharging port, what how to say where he need to plant the bunkers because this is very important as you can see the fuel price is going up and down it's unpredictable yes but you still have to have there are tools i mean there are a lot of uh, how to say companies that provide you information about weather about mm. fuel prices uh, about different types of information and when you use them i shall say you minimize the risk a lot, and the financial impact, uh, that's your responsibility, to, let's say that to have minimum uh, financial impact because something happened. Let's say, mm. like I tell you a store, okay, so now we lost the two days. Lost the two days on, that sounds like forty to $50,000. That's how money <laughs> we can lose. Yeah. But tomorrow the weather's fine, the vessel is going good on right speed, so he can gain those those money and that's what the operator need to monitor they need to try to optimize the financial impact mm. because the trader the one who made the deal he made some estimates right some expecting profit let's say from this voyage the, the, of course is, is the charter the charter manager uh, the the trader the broker in our company who's oh, making the deal the broker. yeah okay our broker who make the deal of the carriage of the of uh, the cargo he makes some estimate i have the estimate in our computer program and uh, basically we made some updates in our computer program every day we receive information from the master every day and it's going up and down every day but i mean uh the important thing is at the end of the voyage. Mm. What have we expected as a profit? What have happened? It could be a disaster. I have one vessel who passed two typhoons. He passed between Whoa. them. I mean, and I'm updating every day what is going on with the ship in our computer program. And we lost for 60,000 for, I know, two, three days. Wow. And our trader seen that in our computer program, asking Christo, what is going on? And I just show him the map <laughs> where <laughs> our vessel is basically bypassing two typhoons. I said, hey, man, this is, it is what it is. I said, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, fine. In this case, you understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the guys <laughs> over there <laughs> trying to survive. Yeah. <laughs> it, could, it, could, it could go in the storm, but maybe some freight will be damaged. I, I, we don't know. So, I, I... No, I mean, uh, how to say? It, it depends. When we talk about, because see some of the questions about the weather and um, weather routing, the best things to do and what we are doing is we're using professional companies, weather routing companies, which are monitoring the weather ahead. Okay. On the beginning of the voyage, I give him their specific information, where, what our plan is, where we're going to go. And they're giving every day a weather forecast to our master with copy to us. So we know every day and the master what can he expect. Mm -hmm. And we discuss, if necessary, just to give an example, a week ago, there was a terrible storm near, near of Cape of Good Hope. And our weather routing company advised us, guys, 
either you wait, either you go back, either you go north, but do not go in the storm. Mm-hmm. This is dangerous. And we discussed with the master. I said, master, I mean, by the end of the way, it's up to you. I mean, we cannot play with safety. Because, you see, let's say that I say to the captain, I don't care, captain, you go and do that storm. And what is the risk? Uh of course, there is a life of the vessel, I mean, of the crew and of the vessel. But let's say that there is a damage of the cargo. Mm. Now, if there is a damage of the cargo, and I have said to the master captain, I don't care, I'm giving you the order, you proceed. And let's say one of, uh, in one of the holes, water penetrates. Now, the buyer of these goods, he's waiting his goods in China, right? So we are carrying, let's say, 180,000. I bring 1,150. And this buyer have a right to claim on this cargo, on the purchase price. And this could be a million dollars. Yeah, imagine. A million dollars. We had a case with one, guys, uh, but that was a long time ago. The claim reached up to 20 million. It started up to 20 million. So let's say... The day I can lose waiting for the storm, fifty thousand dollars. A lot of money, right? A yeah. lot of money. Yeah. But this is what, where the experienced operator need to make a decision. Need to know the perils. So just let's forget about for the vessel and the crew, which is the prime responsibility. For me as an operator, if I know, okay. <laughs> I will not risk millions of dollars of claim to my company mm. when it's come to safety. Yes. So this is type of decisions you need to make. You need to calculate in your head. It comes with the experience. I mean, if let's say we have a voyage charter and it's not written everything. It's not a Bible. <laughs> it's a few pages, right? But you need to know what is, um, how to say, what your responsibilities you have as an operator, mm-hmm. what you can tell to the master. In this particular case, I will never say to the captain to proceed. Never. Mm. Just because it's quite easy to calculate the financial risk. But the good thing is that a young operator can always go to his superior. In my company, for example, in all the companies, there is a... Uh, uh, senior operator, operational manager, who usually is the most experienced guy, the most uh, uh, knowledgeable guy. Mm. And let's say if I have uh, difficulties or maybe I'm wondering what to do, you go to your superior, you discuss, and he advise you. Mm. And uh, it's, we have also a senior operator in our group and it's how to say, as any other work, it's a teamwork. It's we a teamwork. A, yeah, yeah, we have a team. For we, example, maybe, let's say you're a junior operator, I'm a senior operator. Maybe you face a problem, which I never faced in my 20 career. Yes. Maybe you face this problem on the very first day. Mm. And I say, hey, Paul, what did you do, man? And you explain me, we did this. And I say, okay, so uh, you need to be humble also. Mm. I mean, you can never raise your nose because yeah. <laughs> the damages could be devastating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's good to be humble. Yeah. Never mind the experience. Ask your team. Ask uh, even the lower ranks. Why not? I have faced this many times. I have asked some of our cadets and, you know, the fresh mind can give you a fresh perspective. Mm. Sometimes... Uh, let's say you have all the options in your head, but uh, some fresh mind can give you, why don't you do that? And this happened to me on a few occasions. But uh, another thing that uh, which I'm getting to is that vessel operator need to be a team player. Mm. That's a must. Yeah. You have to be a team player. And with who are you working very closely uh, in the company? Most of time. Well, most of I'm work uh, not alone because we are eight operators totally. Uh, okay. We work from time from home, as you can see. 
but uh, we go in our company three times a week in the office. But we communicate all the time on Teams. Uh, we are online all the time, even with cameras, not to check if we are working or not, just to be connected with with the team, just to be, you know, uh, to communicate all the time. Okay. So I'm commuting, communicating with my team. Now we are eight people and our uh, superior operator. We are in communication all the time. Okay. Okay. On what about the ship management company? You know, sometimes uh, the ship is managed by a ship management company. Are you working closely with the sup superintendent or ship manager? Or it's not very common, actually? Uh, yes and no. It depends. For example, my first company, I worked seven years there. It was ship owner company. Basically, okay. they own the ships. A few of them were some time charter. A few of them we were operating by ourselves. And basically... When you own the, the ship, it's like you're owning a car. You need to maintain her. Yeah. And this is where the superintendent comes. In most companies, the superintendents are engineers. I have a friend of mine, very skillful superintendents and engineers. Basically, their job is like to run the engine. Not only the engine, but the ship. Oh, sure. um, pardon? Oh, sure. It's like it's like the chief, the engineer, uh, sure, we can say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it too. Like <laughs> yeah. So like any other engine, he needs spare parts, it needs a correct fuel oil, it needs, uh, it needs uh, lubrication oil, and uh, other stuff, which I'm not that familiar. But in general, when you are a ship owner, and let's say I'm uh, like in my first seven years, I'm an operator in a ship owner company. I work very close with the technical guys. They are basically next to me. Mm. Why? Because when I'm a ship owner, I'm, how to say, obliged to know, and I must know where we're getting the spare parts, where we're getting the lube oil. We had sometimes, because as a ship owner, you need to, um, how to say, you need to think about all the stuff which are, connected for example this is food for the crew right clothes spare parts and lot of other stuff fresh water mm. and on few occasions we stopped on some ports on the way to loading or discharging ports just because the spare parts are more cheap uh for example singapore even if let's say we bypass singapore we do not need uh fuel But this happened a lot. The technical manager come and say to operational manager, if we bypass Singapore, we stop. I need, I need this one. I need this pair of parts. I need this part, those pair of parts. I need, let's say, food because over there is cheap. And it will cost us less to stop to lose, let's say, half a day instead of going, let's say, to, I don't know, some country which the spare parts are a lot more expensive or cannot be transported or something else. And when basically uh, you see the financial impact, we need to make the decisions. When you're uh, like in our company right now, when I hiring a ship, I have no connection with the superintendents. That's not any of my concern. If they need to stop, in Singapore on their account and time, I will place them off higher. I will not pay rent for, let's say, a couple of hours which are there. Okay. And they can do whatever they want. Sometimes they call you and they say, okay, Christo, we need to make some maintenance on our ship. It's planned. We need to stop in the middle of the ocean if the weather is okay for, let's say, six hours, for 12 hours. Vessel is off higher just to let you know which is fine. I cannot say anything. It's their mm. ship by the end of the day. All I can do is place them off high and not pay. But so, yeah. for, for a time charter, it's, it's a problem because you pay for the time, not for the, the voyage. Yeah, pay for time. I mean, if they stop in the middle of the ocean for, to change something, filters of the main engine or something like that, I will stop pay for this amount of time. How do mm. I know? I just tell the captain. Uh, okay, Captain, I need to tell me what time you arrive, what time you depart, 
Now there's a satellites everywhere. They cannot lie. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, they, they will try. But now there's so much systems in the air. I mean, space, you can monitor them. And back in the days, it was a lot more easier. We used to do that. I mean, how to say, when we were a ship owner in my first company, we, we did exactly the same. I don't want my charter to stop my hire, right? Mm. But we need to stop for just a few hours. The technical <laughs> super town tell you, you need to stop. I don't want to break this engine. We said, okay, okay. We say to the captain, you don't say anything. You just stop for a few hours. Then you increase the speed so they will know. Uh. That happened before. But now with all the satellites, with all the systems, everything is so digital. Yes. It's, Everyone it, can track can track a ship now with marine traffic uh, with OIS system. Even my grandmother, she can uh, download marine traffic and see where the ship is. You know. <laughs> well, yes and no. Oh. <laughs> you know, the AIS system. That's uh, how to say. People are thinking that they can track the vessel anywhere with the AIS system. They can do with satellites, not with AIS. I don't want yeah. to get too technical. Yeah. The AIS system is, how to say, Im implemented uh, after the 9-11. You know, the AIS system, it's a VHF system. The VHF <laughs> have arranged till the horizon, right? <laughs> you cannot monitor with marine traffic the vessel in the middle of the ocean. But that's but right. Now there's so many satellite systems. I mean, you cannot hide. You can. You can. And this happens. I don't want to get to. I mean, j just to give you a, a now exciting story, but not not with a good outcome. A friend of mine five years ago, and this is common. N sorry, this is uncommon. They uh, hire a ship. They load it somewhere in Russia, I believe. Uh, five or six thousand of clay, if I remember. And they load it in, no, I don't know, it was somewhere in Russia. So they pass the Black Sea. They pass the Bosphorus, Dardanelles, and the vessel disappeared. Mm. Yeah, it's a scam. Can you imagine? And Unfortunately, it's very rare, but did these things happen and the experienced operator have to be prepared? Now, it's not your job, uh, how to say, you as an operator, you are, how to say, working with the captain. Mm. You're not working with your counterpart. Now, how can this be avoided? Well, in general, you check your business partner. If I know Paul, I will work with him. It's really that simple. If right. I know, let's say, Chris, but I don't know Chris that much, maybe I can check him out. What you do? You check with some banks, we check with some previous mm. counterparties, with business person. Hey, do you know Chris? Yeah, he's Chris reliable. Or somebody tell you, no, no, Chris is not reliable. So now it's up to you. Like any other business, you need to know your counterparty. Because... Okay. Unfortunately, sometimes company bankrupt. Sometimes companies simple are not managed well. We had one big problem with a vessel that was something like seven years ago in a previous company. What happened that we hire a ship which was hired from the owners. We thought that they were the owners, but they were not the owners. They hired from other people. So mm -hmm. the people that we took the ship have not paid we did not knew that it's not it's not actually it's our concern but we have no way to know that that's different contract so i hire we hire the ship from company a company a do not pay to company b <laughs> oh, that's we pay our hire right yes we pay our hire and all of a sudden the ship stop we ask our counterparty hey what is going on? Why the ship stop? Come on, come on. We need. We... Mm. They were silent for a couple of days, and the head owners, the actual owners, contact us and they explain to us we don't see a single dollar for a month. And uh -huh. <laughs> what we can do, we, we're keeping our ship. We stop you... our ship till we get our money. 
we start finding with the, with our counterparty they bankrupt oh yeah well it's a business it's a business it's for a pop, business but in this case you lost money as well because oh you... it's a very heavy it's very yeah. heavy we okay. are forced to bring the cargo and we lost the, i don't know i mean it's it become a legal case I don't mm. know how much the company lost, but this risks. By the end of the day, there are insurances for that. Yes. I mean, but uh, let's say the, by the end of the day, the insurance will pay. But next week, the insurer will come. Okay, now your premium is <laughs> three times more, man. <laughs> You're a risky company. Oh, no, the no, good no. thing in our business is that there's insurance for everything. But literally everything okay. even for incompetent crew <laughs> but you will just yeah <laughs> we, we had this issue a couple of years ago the ship grounded but basically she touched the bottom simply because i don't know what happened probably the crew slept probably they are incompetent i don't know and she got to repairs a big issue and by the end of the day, the ship owner said, okay, it's our fault. The crew is negligent. So he admitting that he hired, <laughs> I would say stupid crew or incompetent. And still he have insurance for that mm-hmm. as well. Everything is insured. That, that, that's a good thing. That's the, hey, the, that's the insurance. Actually, it's a business on even, uh, you can insure <sighs> everything basically. Well, that's part of the operator have to know as well. I mean, not in details, but I have been dealing with insurance a lot, insurance people, because basically everything is insured. When we were ship owner, when something happened, for, for example, there was in one hold, we were carrying grain, and in the hold, some pipe burst with water and we damaged the cargo. It's totally mm-hmm. our fault. I mean, it's our job to maintain the ship. Okay, some pipe, something happening, pressure, rust, God knows. End of story. Mm. We receive a claim, I don't remember. There is a claim department which do it with claims. It's not my job because it's more a legal point of view. And when, how to say, things escalate to claims, etc., etc., we are involved as operators, but we provide support and information. Like if you sue somebody, you hire a lawyer, right? So in our company, for example, we have a legal department. And when things escalate, you involve them. You provide all the information. They're approaching the other counterpart. Let's say it's a ship owner. Let's say it's a charterer. And we leave up to the, uh, up to the lawyers. But okay. by the end of the day, somebody have to pay. <laughs> And thank for God that they are insurance. Otherwise, I mean, can you imagine if somebody claim you for 20 million? Yeah, you can go bankrupt for one case if it's not. Exactly. Yeah. You pay a lot of insurances. I mean, it's they are expensive. But by the end of the day, they will keep your business afloat. That's the thing. Yeah, that's that's good to know, to, to think about it because sometimes people complain, uh, I, I pay a lot this insurance, but if it's going bad, Think about the consequences. Um, exactly. Yeah. And you need to find, but that's not operating job, a good insurance company, a reliable oh. insurance company that will pay you. I will give you a small example. Sorry if I'm <laughs> talking too much. But... <laughs> it's very interesting. So you can go ahead. Yeah, go. Very, so what happened, actually, this is not in my company. This is my friend's company. What happened that there was a main engine failure and the ship went to ground. And it was a sand. I mean, this is very important. That's okay. The ship went into a sand. I mean, there are damages, but not that much. So let's say a tugboat came, you know, they go to another bird, repairs, etc., etc. But the thing is that my friend's company had a serious financial issues at that particular time. Mm. And they was they don't have enough money. And we're talking about hundreds stuff like $300,000. And they don't have this amount in them right now. And they go to the insurance company and say, guys, okay, pay this, right? I'm insured, pay this. And I just need to resume my voyage. And the insurance company said, 
Um, no, you pay it and send me the invoices. I will pay you in 30 days time. And they start some negotiations here and there, but by the end of the day, the insurers, the insurer company said to them, I will pay you everything after 30 days when you give me the invoices. But they did not have that, um, uh, that amount. As far as I remember, they go to a bank, the bank gives some loan. Of course, you pay interest. <laughs> yes. But uh, so you need to be very careful. I mean, in my opinion, the higher you pay to insurer, better. It's okay. it's not something that oh, you okay. can you can play. And That's... me as an operator, in case of incident, I need to know who our insurer is. I need to involve him immediately to go on site to inspect, to protect us, protect him because he has to pay if we are fault. Yeah. And this is very important if we talk about incidents and communication with insurance. The operator job is to know who to contact from the insurance company. They are 24 hours. They are available all the time in the different companies. To engage him immediately, I have called insurance representatives in the middle of night in China. He was <laughs> sleepy. I said, guy, you go. But <laughs> that was his job, right? So yeah. he said, okay, in three hours I will be on board and, and we'll inspect. Me as an operator need to do everything right now. I called the captain. It was, uh, again, damaged with some cargo. I said, captain, you continue discharging, but leave this hold in the cargo there. It was some oil or something like that. It was minor thing, but the receivers made a big thing. It was something like a couple of kilos. But they saw oil, but well, anyway... So what the operator do? I, I call our insurance guy, representative, to go on site to assess the damages. I advise the master, okay, this guy is coming. He's our insurer. I need you to provide him everything. He go there, take pictures. He's a maritime person, either a captain or trained surveyor. He inspect what is going on. In this case, I don't remember exactly from there this oil came out or what exactly happened, but I remember it was 10 kilos of goods, which is nothing. I mean, come on, mm -hmm. we, we carry 50,000 of wheat and you're going to claim for 10 kilos? No. So what no. happened is that you as an operator, you need to advise your insurer to go immediately, immediately, not tomorrow, right now. Because oh. if they discharge this cargo of the ship, you don't have control of this cargo, right? I don't know where it is. Let's say that um, uh, yes, they claim uh, and they discharge it in China. Go in trucks. Yeah. Good luck to Final. to recommend it, yeah. Uh. Yeah. Tomorrow you will receive a claim for 20 tons. Yeah. And here's the operator. Captain, stop. If this was the last cargo, I don't care. I will say the captain, stop. He will not discharge till okay. our insurance guy came and inspect. Okay. Oh, it's very interesting to know. The time is going very fast. I want to ask you three last questions. Yes, uh, yes. So <laughs> the first question I want to ask you, uh, this is, how are you making the calculation for the fuel, the, the, the time you need to go? Because you need to know the specification of the ship. You need to know uh, the fuel capacity, a lot of things. How can you take into consideration all this stuff? Yes, of course. I mean, even if I hire a ship, uh, I receive... Uh, special information that you receive about the vessel. It's quite easy. The vessel have, usually they have five or six or four tanks. I know the capacity and the captain sent to me. We have information from the ship owners and from the master, how much he consumed per day on which speed. Mm -hmm. And you just calculate the distance. Okay. And you, what is important is you calculate in the distance and where you're going to take bunker. Like I told you, okay, maybe I can stop and keep the good hope, but do I risk it? Or maybe I go in Singapore? And this is type of things that uh, you need to calculate the consumption and where is the best place to take supply of fuel. Mm. Okay. Okay. There's other Very complications, but I don't so, want to make do too you... much of your time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But do you use sometimes tools like CRM or we can help you? Because, of course, you need to use technology, I, th I imagine. 
Uh, sorry, I lost you for a second, Paul. Can you repeat the oh, question? Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I was the, I said like, uh, do you use like CRM, uh, this kind of technology tools, uh, IT tools to help you with this cal calculation? No, but this is quite simple calculation. You know, I mean, okay. you know, the mileage, I mean, the distance, let's say from Singapore to Tubarao. Yes. You know, the distance, how much uh, time will take, let's say 20 days, you know, it will be 20 tons, let's say per day. So you know how much she will consume from point A to point B and from to point C. So now you have to know, and there are bunker information a lot, where is cheaper, where is less risky. Okay. Uh, give you an example in port of Zhoushan in China, it's a very good price, but they are supplying only at Anchorage. <laughs> now you need to check the weather forecast, all right? <laughs> so if the weather is bad, I can wait yeah. three days and I lost, let's say, $60,000. So they go my calculation. But let's say there is another port nearby, but they calculate at birth, but the cost is higher, right? Mm. So now, well, you take the information what you have and you need to make a decision. Okay, sometimes you lose, sometimes you don't. If you ask me, I will always go to the birth. Okay. <laughs> Always. <laughs> but uh, with it comes with experience. Some guys prefer to risk. I don't think. I mean, you can. I mean, you can calculate. Okay, how much you're going to win from the price against how much you're going to lose. In my opinion, it's always better to play to play safe, okay. like the turtle. Okay, it's good to know. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask another question. So I have, uh, you have a very big expense as vessel operator. So it's a little bit longer than expected. But if you have uh, five minutes left, it's fine. Um, you operate on many kind of vessels. You say uh, capsize, uh, maybe others. I, I don't know. You will t uh, t uh, tell us. Uh, what is the difference depending the kind of vessel? Do we have like most complicated challenge? A vessel to ma to to manage. Can you elaborate on this on it, please? Very good question, Paul. Now, yeah, the let's say the most I should not say common, but let's say well, the most common vessels there for twenty five thousand dead weight. That's a how much capacity of cargo he can take up to fifty sixty. Yeah. Why? Because gives you the how to say, the options to load and discharge big variety of cargos. When and you're going to basically everywhere, it's a lot more challenging. When you are operating like, like now with me, Cape size ships, they're mostly ca carrying only all type of ore and coal. Basically, the variety of cargo is very little and the complications are always the same. But if you have a small ship, uh, she can load, if just give you a small example, let's say that you carry a coal. Now you can imagine if you have a coal in uh, one ship, what kind of a dust is that? What kind of a dirt is that? Mm -hmm. So we need to clean it very good. If you want to load wheat, wheat it have to be very clean, extremely mm -hmm. clean, which is challenging, right? But when you have a bigger ship, you load very limited type of cargos. You have limited options. It is quite more easy. Okay, I have no more than three to four type of cargos which I need to be prepared. And I am prepared all the time. But with the smallest, 25 up to 50, it could be anything. Now, that's a good from the trading point of view. Because like any market, when you have an option, you can make more money, right? Mm. That's good for the brokers, for the traders. But for us as operators, sometimes vessel depart and you don't know from what type of cargo you have to prepare it. And I need to know. Because, mm. for example, the iron ore, it's very how to say it's not dirty, but it's oily on the mm. surface and you need to clean with chemicals. If you carry coal, it's a dust 
you need a little bit of chemicals, but with water it will okay. Okay, so I don't know what I'm going to carry, so how I'm going to prepare? Mm. Well, it, what you do, you prepare for the work, worst case <laughs> scenario, <laughs> but that will ex we will spend more money, right? Mm. You will spend more money for equipment. You will spend more money for storage and here and there. So it's more complicated. Uh, I mean, the less the vessel is, I mean, not the less, let's say 25 up to 50, it's a lot more difficult for an operator. It's a lot, it's a lot more challenging. Mm. But okay. it's exciting, you know. It's exciting. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Very good uh... I was like, yeah, because you have so many kind of vessels. Which type exactly? You you say uh, cap size? Uh, that's twenty hundred thousand dead weight. That's a cap size. Ship. Okay, that's what they call. Okay, okay. I mean Panamax, uh, Supermax. They are fifty to eighty thousand, and handy size. They are below fifty thousand. Okay, I mean there are also ships with five five thousand, six thousand dead weight. They are also loading a lot of commodities, but they're mm. going some small ports. The bigger, let's say, uh, the vast amount of ships which are there in the sea are, I would say, between 20 and 60 okay. thousand that way. That's a cargo capacity. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. On the, I want to ask you a last question. What uh, advice can you give to someone who wants to start a career as vessel operator? <sighs> Well, it's first of all, it's an exciting job. I love it, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to give a, advice, well, be brave, okay. be humble, learn every day, ask questions, and be prepared to learn every day. It's mm -hmm. an exciting job. It depends on what background you have. If you don't have background, to be on a ship, I will encourage young people to go and spend some time. I'm not talking about months. You can go on a ship when she's discharging, when she's loading, Mark. just to see. Mm -hmm. This is extremely important to see, to touch the ship, to go in the cargo hold. Mm -hmm. I will, if a guy who don't have a seagoing experience, it's a must, just to mm -hmm. feel how to say the steel I will put it this way okay but uh, it's a good job to be in I like it yeah I can see you really like it you are very enthusiastic when talking about it um, <gasps> the, your, your first day as the vessel operator it was complicated you were lost or you managed everything oh yeah oh it was <laughs> first months every day I was going with a headache almost oh, wow. a headache well I was very fortunate to be with very extremely experienced people. It's like I'm into space and no, not in space. I would put it like the, in the water without be able to swim. Okay. I can swim a little bit, not, you know, just keep my head, but like the other guys, there were sharks, you oh, know, wow. this and that. It takes time to learn, but uh, when you learn it, it's exciting. Is changing. That's a good thing about this job. It ch it's, it's changing. It's changing. It's, I mean, now the IT sector is coming a lot. Now the environmental procedures, they're changing a lot. It's not like a job that, uh, how to say, it changed a lot from the day I started. It changed okay. a lot. And that keeps the operators motivated. Okay. In my opinion. Okay. Good, uh, good to know. So, uh, Istro, I think uh, we are in the end of the podcast. Thank you very much to to accept my invitation. It was very in uh, insightful. You talk, you bring so many value. If you want to add something, uh, it's the moment. If anybody wants to start this type of job, I will say that uh, it's something. How to say? You need to be prepared. It's a twenty-four-seven job. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, but it's but it's worth it. If you if uh, I I also know a few girls that I ask them why are you starting this job because I like it like any other thing. If you don't like it, don't start it. No, okay. <laughs> it's not for everybody. <laughs> it's not for everybody. <laughs> wow, wow. 
Ok, Istro. Thank you very much, Istro. I, I wish you all the best uh, in your future career. And uh, I wish you, of course, a pleasant uh, evening. Uh, it's the evening right now. And uh, I hope to see you uh, around, maybe in the industry, uh, maybe in a show, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if, uh, how to say, if you want to invite me again, thank you very much for this opportunity. It was a pleasure uh, to speak with you. I'm very excited and very happy there are young people like you that they want to introduce our, uh, how to say, trade, our job. I don't think that our job in general, the shipping, des uh, how to say, takes the credit yeah. that she deserves in the economy. So appreciate that there are young guys like you doing that. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, again, have a very nice day. Bye bye. Take you care. Too. Have a nice bye day. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening and watching this episode. We are looking forward to bring you more inspiring stories for maritime professionals, experts, and students. Do not hesitate to leave a review on Apple Podcast and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Your support means a lot to us, and it greatly helps in our continuous growth. We committed to bringing you more exciting episodes with passionate guests.